Hello, my name is Nikita. I'm an open source developer from Scotland. And today I'd like to talk to you about bringing new higher levels of abstractions to eBBF. Uh, so we already have lots of great existing tools like BPF Trace or libbpf, and we often use them to create our own tools based on BPF with uh, applications in observability, network engineering, and uh, well, you name it. But in my mind, uh, the problem with uh, these tools is that they are really hard for someone who is just starting with low-level programming, or even for someone who already has lots of experience in Linux. And I'm speaking from my personal experience here because it's pretty challenging to start um, writing BPF programs. You need to take care of both uh, the user space and kernel space programs. And even if you're using BPF trace, as great as this tool is, it can be non-intuitive in many ways, not in the least because it's mostly a command line utility. And uh, command line tools um, have served us well over many decades, but they are not using the full power that the modern technologies give us. So for example, you cannot do more interesting visualizations in the command line and the interaction usually happens through text only, leaving graphics and input devices such as a mouse unused. Uh, but there's also the factor of the sheer complexity of low level languages. So what I would like to discuss here is the idea of taking inspiration from databases. Uh, with traditional database systems, we can make quite sophisticated queries without writing much code besides SQL, which can be seen as another API or another layer of abstraction on top of a typical database system. So for example, when we write database queries, we don't go over such minor details uh, like reading files from a disk. We don't even think in terms of loops or conditionals. We are just describing what is the result we would like to get and not how exactly to obtain this result. <laughs> this part is usually for a database system to figure out. Um, so this gives us an interesting idea. Why don't we try to see the Linux kernel itself as a sort of a database um, which will provide us with all kinds of information about the state of the system. Um, but the problem with uh, this idea is that when we work with databases, we think about the data as something static. Uh, while in the case of the Linux kernel, we deal with millions of events which happen every second. Um, in the database world, this problem is usually solved um, with streaming systems like Apache Spark or Flink. Um, and in those systems, instead of asking questions about stored data, um, we store the questions themselves and pass the dynamic data streams through them. And as a result, we can filter or transform this data using the familiar uh, SQL language constructs and then collect and analyze this data however we want. Um, one advantage of such systems is that the data stream can be uh, unbounded, meaning that it has no start and it really has no end. So it's practically infinite and spontaneous. And the streaming system can run queries over very long periods of time, which sounds quite similar to uh, what we do with the Linux events tracing. So we can try to take inspiration from streaming systems as well. But uh, of course, we have another slight problem with this idea. Like, uh, how do we deal with millions of events? How do we source these data points from the kernel and filter or aggregate them? Well, we don't need to think much about it because, of course, we have eBPF. And we can compile queries down to eBPF code and execute it at the point where these events happen in, in, inside the kernel. Um, and as a concrete example, let's construct a very simple SQL-like query, which will count a number of system calls made by all processes in the system. And in this case, we are interested in system calls with the um, ID 1, which correspond to the open syscall. And once we execute this query, 
it will automatically attach the uh, resulting BPF program to the kernel probe and it will start gathering and displaying results. Uh, so how this works is basically this query is broken down into multiple simple operators, starting with the print, which uh, requests the data from the uh, aggregate operator, which in turn requests the filter data. And in the end, it goes down to the kernel probe, which sources data from the kernel and sends it back upwards. Um, and once we have that, we can compile each operator into efficient BPF code, which will take care of both the user space and kernel space for us. And we don't even need to care about the verifier in this case. Um, on this slide, you can see uh, some Python pseudocode. And each line of this code is translated from the operators on the left side. And what's interesting here is that operators can be used to generate data structures in addition to code. So as you can see, the aggregate operator has created a separate BPF map for us to transfer uh, the data to the user space. So we don't need to spend time thinking about it. Um, what we have seen so far doesn't look very different from BPF trace, though. Um, it's more like uh, just a different flavor of syntax. But in fact, uh, there is actually an important distinction here because we put the data at the forefront uh, and that makes us think in a different way about those programs. Uh, like in the case of in the case of BPF trace, we mostly write code in the imperative style, while um, SQL and uh, the streaming abstractions make you think more in terms of the declarative style of programming. And this, um, the, the declarative style um, gives us an option of presenting it in a visual way. Uh, so for each operator in the SQL query, we can introduce a corresponding visual block. These visual blocks can be connected and composed in an intuitive way, making a kind of a graph that shows the flow of the data from, uh, from top to bottom. Um, and first we have uh, data sources like the kernel or user probes, and we have data syncs, which will uh, display the data or send it further like to a logging server or a, a database or a file. It's basically uh, for you to choose. And between the data sources and sinks, we can manipulate the data in the stream. Um, we can filter it, aggregate it, or combine it from multiple data sources. It, we basically can do uh, whatever we want with it. Um, and this approach helps us to see the flow of the data. And once we move into the realm of visual representation, um, we uh, we can start doing uh, we can start doing some uh, really interesting things with it, like uh, live programming. Uh, and what this means is that you will be able to see the immediate feedback after changing the properties of each visual block. So once we change the process name in the filter, for example, the program will um, will be automatically recompiled, and you will start to get new results. This is more similar to the reactive style of programming, which you can find in things like spreadsheets where you can dynamically change cells and the entire sheet will be recomputed immediately. <clears throat> uh, the interesting part here is that uh, because we have complete information about the program, we can also build the runtime dependency graph, uh, which can include data that is gathered from sources uh, other than the kernel and uh, eBPF. It doesn't even have to be a single machine or a single container. So if we combine and compose these visual blocks, we can build quite complex systems and programs this way. Uh, so for example, let's take a look at the program on this slide. Uh, here we are first waiting for um, waiting for an event that comes from our distributed tracing system that can use something like uh, the open telemetry api and in this case um, this can be a trigger for an event like an http request and it also uh, the the, the uh, http requests come with uh, some context information about the request which we can use later 
Um, next, we can also gather some events from an eBPF probe. And in this case, we are interested in a um, number of memory allocations that happen within the span of and within the context of the HTTP request. Um, and the compiler and the execution engine will automatically figure out the correct order of events. So in this case, the memory allocations will be collected only after the HTTP request event is triggered. And since we have the context information from the tracing system, we can also uh, filter events by the uh, target HTTP endpoint or any other uh, information from the HTTP headers. Um, in, in this particular case, we are interested only in events that happen within um, request to the login page of a web application. And finally, at the last step, we collect the size of a memory allocation from the kernel event and um, log the results to a file. And of course, we can also send them forward to the same distributed tracing system or to a database of your choice or to a file. Well, you get it. And as you might have noticed, we also use formulas here to describe the kind of data we are interested in. This is pretty similar to how the formulas work in spreadsheets where you can refer to other cells. And in this case, you can refer to other visual blocks too. And, and the system here is very flexible. Uh, we can split the data into several substreams uh, where one stream can go into the uh, logging block and another can feed into a block that will, for example, count the number of allocations or find, um, find an average size of an allocation. And it doesn't have to be just text either because we can also feed data into a chart or a histogram or any other kind of um, visualization block which you can also um, um, which you can also fine tune and choose dynamically depending on the flavor of your data so ultimately this system could become a kind of a universal tool set supporting data sources like distributed tracing systems and telemetry or function calls in, uh, from multiple languages, um, from multiple language runtimes, or streaming databases. And all these data sources can be combined into, um, can be combined in multiple ways and synchronized to work together in a single system. Um, so these examples that you have seen work in a web browser. Uh, using a WebSocket connection to transfer data in real time. So once you have constructed your program from um, from these building visual uh, from this visual building blocks, we can send the entire program to the server where it is compiled down to eBPF code, and it is immediately executed. This way, the visual representation of a program becomes a kind of a zero cost abstraction. So it makes no difference. Uh, it, it, it looks no different to, uh, a, to a similar program that you might have written uh, yourself. And the execution engine takes care of attaching to uh, user probes or kernel probes, and it's communicating between the user space and the kernel space using eBPF maps, which can be uh, very efficient, especially in the uh, case of special kinds of maps like ring buffers. So basically, we can transfer uh, the data from eBPF maps into WebSocket almost immediately. And then this data can be displayed and rendered and uh, handled by JavaScript. Um, and for the most part, as a user, you don't even need to, to, you don't even need to uh, care about all this. Uh, but if you would like to implement your own operators, uh, you can do so by extending the compiler, which is written in Rust. So you can introduce your own data sources, data sinks, or um, other new functions. Um, and of course, this approach is not ideal. And with the complex scenarios, you would probably still opt for writing your program uh, using libbpf or other proven production tools. Uh, but an important point here is that you will be able to use existing scripts and programs by embedding them as separate visual blocks into your pipeline. Uh, 
and it can work uh, the other way around too like uh, you can call programs you build in 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 this visual style from your existing tools or apps this visual approach also has several important advantages over um, over command line tools uh, so for example it's more amenable to a loading and showing more debug information. So for example, when you switch the debug mode on, you will be able to immediately see what kinds of data you get in each of the visual blocks and what kind of data pass through your pipeline. I think another important part of this is that um, it's not only a visual interface, but more like an integrated development environment with features like code highlighting and code completion. Um, and uh, recent advancements in eBPF, such as PDF, uh, which provides type information about structures, can definitely help with that. And, um, well, at this level of abstraction, it's also easier to optimize programs because the compiler can construct ad hoc data structures to transfer data from BPF programs more efficiently. And so, in conclusion, we have talked about an alternative way of thinking about BPF programs. Um, and this approach is certainly not a replacement for writing code in complex scenarios, but in many cases, I think it can provide a simple and fun solution to the problem of complexity. Because personally, I sometimes struggle with uh, some parts of writing code for BPF, like dealing with the verifier or <clears throat> thinking about the kernel side of things. It's all very tricky. And this project is currently in the very experimental alpha stage and it's under heavy development, but it's open source um, and you can find the source code at the, at the GitHub page you can see on the slide and try it yourself. Um, and that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will be available on Slack to answer your questions. Thank you.